Welcome to the Learn True Health Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 52. Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health Podcast. Today, I have a fantastic guest. She's a doctor that helps people heal from head injuries, specifically from concussions, something that it's quite amazing when you have a concussion. Um, sometimes you don't even know you have one and yet you experience all kinds of very scary symptoms which could include uh, blindness, temporary blindness and even suicide. And yet when we go to the hospital, the doctors give us very uh, basic instructions like go home and don't fall asleep, what, make sure someone watches you so you don't fall into a coma. I mean, it's there's no healing when it comes to Western medicine from uh, head injuries, from a concussion. And yet this doctor of uh, classical and traditional Chinese medicine helps people all the time around the world heal from concussions and head injuries. And actually, she specializes in sports medicine using the 5,000 plus year old system of healing. Uh, She has some best-selling, international best-selling books, and she's just a fantastic community, fantastic author and doctor. So I'm very excited for you to hear our interview. But first, I want to let you know about some exciting news for the Learn True Health podcast community. My husband and I have been talking about how we can make this even more accessible for you to learn true health. So we created a Facebook group. It's a free Facebook group for all listeners to join. Uh, just go to learntruehealth.com slash group or you can go to Facebook and type in Learn True Health uh, in the search bar and you'll find us. Uh, We have invited all of our past guests from our 52 episodes, all the wonderful doctors and authors and holistic health experts to join the group as well. And people are now beginning to join. We just started this group less than 24 hours ago. And so uh, as all the listeners join and as all the health experts join, We will be able to create a community where you can ask our experts questions, where the experts can offer more information, and we can have um, discussions about the episodes that you loved, and you can suggest to me uh, within the group um, other guests and other, you know, topics you wish for me to explore with these holistic health experts. So join our community. The community is for you. It's to serve you and to help you learn true health health. So please visit uh, learntruehealth.com slash group or just go to Facebook and type in Learn True Health and you'll find the group there. Looking forward to seeing you in the group and working with me to create a fantastic holistic health community. Enjoy the show. My next guest is such an interesting doctor. I'm so thrilled to have you on the show, Dr. Joni Liu. You are a traditional Chinese medicine doctor and you uh, focus in the aspect of sports medicine and helping people recover from uh, head injuries, particularly from concussions. So welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much, Ashley. And I would love joining you on your mission to change your the lives uh, of your listeners by bringing holistic health information to them who, like you, are seeking better health naturally. That's fantastic. Now, you're a fellow Canadian. I'm a Canadian living in the States, but I just oh. happened to notice with your wonderful accent that, and also that you said you're living in Calgary, uh, Alberta. Is that where you have your practice? Yes. You know, I just had this feeling that you were Canadian, <laughs> but I don't know why, but yeah. <laughs> You didn't sp- explicitly come out with it in your bio, but... <laughs> it just, you know, I, I can't shake this accent. I've been here 10 years and I say about and house <laughs> and all the Americans laugh and go, say about again, say about again. <laughs> so it's yeah, it's wonderful uh, interviewing a fellow Canadian. But yeah, so you have your um, practice in uh, Calgary, Alberta. I do know we have some Canadian listeners, so I'd urge hey. them to go check you out. What's your um, practice called? It's called Extraordinary Sports Medicine. Fantastic. Now, uh, you use traditional Chinese medicine um, to help people uh, recover their health. Do you only work specifically with uh, concussions or do you do all kinds of sports medicine? 
Well, concussions is definitely my main passion. And the reason why it is, is because in conventional medicine, there is no treatment for concussions. They, they kind of skirt around that issue. And that's why uh, they spend so much time focusing on the diagnostics. But the diagnostics for concussion are actually very easy. What they're really missing and, won't, and what they won't admit is that there is no treatment in conventional medicine for concussions. And that's why there's so much panic and fear out there. And I want people to know that there are definitely concrete steps that you can take if you suspect that you have a concussion. It's so true. I, I You know, you watch TV and it's like, oh, just you have a concussion, go home, put ice on your head and have someone make sure you don't fall asleep. Mm, yeah, which is pretty contradictory because they're telling you to rest on the one hand and yet you're not allowed to fall asleep. Um, it's it's just weird. <laughs> but, but I do remember that kind of advice um, before I embarked on this journey into classical Chinese medicine um, because I was a professional engineer in, here in Calgary, Alberta for 24 years before I decided that I needed to have a lot more meaning in my life. <laughs> so I decided to, um, to do something else and did my research and found out that with traditional Chinese medicine, which is what they basically teach in any college uh, for Chinese medicine these days, that I could use all the all the things that I had accumulated over time in my life because I already knew quite a bit about diet and nutrition and about fitness uh, as a hobby, and so I could put bring all that into a practice of Chinese medicine. Fantastic. Now, I personally have had some amazing experiences with traditional Chinese medicine. Uh, when I was pregnant, my baby was mm -hmm. going to come out feet first. And at uh -huh. week, week 32, <laughs> I could not believe it. I actually had to transfer from midwifery care to an OBGYN due to complications late in the pregnancy. And at week 32, I walk in for my first meeting my OB and she goes, oh, yeah, feet first, no problem. Um, go see an acupuncturist. And I nearly fell off the table because I... I did not expect an MD to tell me to go see an acupuncturist because I would turn my baby around. Sure enough, I found an amazing acupuncturist here in Seattle, uh, Jasmine Bay. She focuses on prenatal um, acupuncture and, and family acupuncture. She put two, two uh, needles in my ankles and said, oh, yeah, this this is the chi that goes up and turns yeah. the, in the belly. Yeah. And uh, five <laughs> minutes later, it was like an experience from the Aliens movie. Um, my son oh. popped his head up into my belly and then did a turn a 90 degree turn oh. and then later that day he turned the rest of the way and he stayed head down in the correct facing the correct way um <laughs> laterally to to come out perfectly so it was absolutely amazing and after that i was completely sold i mean i've i've seen uh chinese uh, medicine doctors before but there was that was the clearest example of it, it working um so it was to me it's a no-brainer to absolutely <laughs> see you especially if i were to have a concussion now um, why did you uh, hone in on and choose to focus in on sports medicine and, and, and working with uh, healing concussions? I've never heard of a traditional Chinese medicine doctor working in the field specifically of sports medicine. Well, it's not really that surprising because a lot of people come to us with their aches and pains and actually their sports injuries. So it's really not that unusual. I mean, uh, a lot of runners will come to me because of knee problems. Uh, you know, soccer players also have knee problems, but they could also have shoulder problems. Um, so it's really not that unusual, but maybe it is unusual for them to actually... Um, just specialize in sports medicine. Maybe that's what's unusual. Uh, and the thing is about concussions, well, the thing is, is that I, I actually do have a healing process that I use over and over again. And of course, uh, the circumstances are different for every single person that come to me, but the backbone of the healing process is always the same. And it was way back in... January 1st, 2011, and Washington Capitals were playing uh, 
uh, Pittsburgh Penguins. And Sidney Crosby actually got a concussion that day. And so usually I, I don't follow this sort of news very much or very closely because hockey players and professional athletes, they get injured all the time. <laughs> well, not all the time, but every week there's reports about somebody getting hurt. And usually they, they don't say a whole lot these days. But in Sidney Crosby's case, because he's such a high-value player, they talked about him. And it wasn't really that unusual, except for the fact that I started to realize that uh, as the reports started coming in, it was coming in weekly, monthly, <laughs> and, then, and he wasn't coming back. And since he is of such high value to the team and to the franchise, that there was obviously some real concern there. And his doctors were struggling because they couldn't come up with a treatment. And so they were re-diagnosing him so that they could treat him for that. And it... it it was a real puzzle for them for almost two years. And finally, he did come back after two years. Now, the reason why concussions came on my radar was because my son, my oldest son in 2012, had a very severe concussion. And he, he is an adult. He was 28 years old at the time. He was playing in his men's league soccer match. When, for some reason, he was on one side of the field, and he was marking his man, he was a defender, and his teammate on the other side of the field, on the opposite side, actually kicked the balls towards him. And, well, my son was totally unprepared for it, and he was hit square on the right side of the head, just above the ear, and then he went down. So his teammates gathered him up, took him to the sidelines, and then left him there to, re to recover. Well, it was while he was sorting things out, and he knew he had his eyes opened when he realized he couldn't see. <gasps> so he was blinded. And so imagine the terror that he must have felt <laughs> because, you know, going blind is not something that happens to you every day and and so he just sat there and he waited and he doesn't know how long he waited but it could have been 10 or 20 minutes but thank god the eyesight did finally come back and then he made a decision it was a beautiful warm hot august day this is 2012 and his teammates his team was actually shorthanded, so they didn't have any substitutes, so he decided to go back on the field. And he did it because he felt responsible. He felt that, okay, even if I feel terrible and I can't do anything out there, at least my teammates can sub on and off and get a break. And so he did this until the end of the game, and then he, you know, got himself all you know changed and he drove home and that's when the headache started and he knew he had a concussion there was absolutely no doubt in his mind that he had a concussion so he decided that he was going to deal with this himself because after all he is an adult and um and he's got his own place and everything. He's been taking care of himself for several years already. So he decided that he was going to cut out all his extracurricular activities and rest whenever he could. But the one thing that he couldn't stop doing was going into work because he is also a, a very busy chemical engineer. <laughs> and, and at that time, it was just crazy, crazy in Calgary and there was no way that he could possibly take a few days off work so he continued to go into work so it was more than two weeks later when I got a call one Monday night and he said mom I was hit so hard in the head I got a concussion I went blind and I thought blind <laughs> and and then he told me the story that I just told you about how it happened. 
And so at this moment, at, by that point, everything had gone from bad to worse because now he wasn't eating, he wasn't sleeping, he had no appetite, he had headaches almost all the time. He was still going into work and he knew that he couldn't keep this up. Having no sleep, he was going to go crazy. And even though at the moment it wasn't, it didn't look like it was affecting his work, he knew as a professional engineer that his first duty is public safety. And any decision that he makes had better be based on that. He, there was no way that he wanted to put his career and the public safety on the line. So he knew he had to do something. So he called me up. And then he asked me for help. Now, I want to back up a few years earlier when we were both at school. He was at the University of Alberta studying engineering. And I was at in Calgary studying traditional Chinese medicine at the Alberta College of Acupuncture and Traditional Chinese Medicine. And he just called me out of the blue that day, too. So, you see... My my children don't need to call me very often. My adult children don't need to call me very often. But when they absolutely need help, they will call out. And and apparently, my son had just found out that a teammate of his down in Calgary had committed suicide. Mm. And and so my son was very upset. Mom, why would he do such a thing? Well, apparently this young man had just found out that his father had been diagnosed with a brain tumor. And this young man decided one day to walk in front of a light rail transit train while it was moving. And he stepped in front of it and he was hit and he died. And and my son was like, why would he do this? Why would he end it? Because suicide was just simply not on his radar, not on too many people's radar. And I thought about it and I said, you know, his father's diagnosis was probably not the reason why he committed suicide, but it was probably the last straw. He probably had many things over time which he didn't like, I mean, and really disliked. And then finally, this was it. That was the last straw. And, and so he ended his life. And then I said to Nolan, I said, Nolan, I want you to know that your mom and dad are always here. We're always here to help you. So whenever there's a problem, please call us and don't ever give up. So... That night, when he asked me for help for his concussion, of course I said yes. And then I said, okay, then you've got to do every single thing that I tell you to do. I didn't know what those things were going to be. Um, we'd have to go through my diagnostic process first, which is a very detailed uh, Q&A process and that's all the testing that we need in Chinese medicine we do um, we observe and we listen we ask really good questions and we listen so one of the things that I ended up asking my son to do was after I found out that he was very upset at work I mean we already had an inkling of this uh, at the beginning of the summer that there was trouble at work but we weren't going to find out how, just how bad it was until he got his concussion. And the thing is, is that there was a brand new supervisor, which the company had took quite a bit of time, quite a long time to find. And so after six months, they finally had this new supervisor. And at his very first meeting with his young engineers, he told them, well, I want to be your friend. Well, this did not go very well <laughs> with these young people because what they were looking for was somebody who was a leader, somebody who could clear the path for them, answer their questions, give them guidance. They did not want a friend. So Nolan's 
best buddy at work immediately said, well, I'm going to look for another job and I'm leaving. And so his friend did exactly that. However, my son really loves working at this company. But at the same time, he also didn't want to work for this guy. My son thought that he only had two choices, to either leave the company that he loved working or he'd have to put up with working for this new supervisor. So after some more analysis, I presented a third option to him. And I said, you know, the thing is, is that you're the one with the problem. You're the one who's suffering. So you have to make or take the steps in order to change the situation because this guy hasn't got a clue about what's happening with you and more than likely he probably doesn't care or he doesn't even know right he, he doesn't know what's going on with you that there's a problem so what I advise my son because Having been in corporate for 24 years myself, I didn't want him to make the same mistakes that I made. So we were going to break the cycle right there and then if he really wanted to. Because I knew that what I was going to ask my son to do was going to be difficult. It was going to stretch him. It was going to go against his very nature. So it was really going to hinge on whether he wanted to be well or not in order to do this. So what I instructed my son was to set up weekly meetings with his supervisor and in that meeting to ask him for what he wanted from him. And so I waited. And I waited for my son to, <laughs> to react to it because he's a very quiet guy. He's not the type of person who's going to blurt out or tell you, you know, what his personal issues are, and especially not to an engineer, to another engineer. So I waited. And my son, God bless him, he said, okay, I'll do it. And I knew he wasn't comfortable with the idea but I'm also an accountability partner, so every time I saw him, I asked him about how it was going. It was just one of those things that I checked up with him every, every time we saw each other. And, you know, the thing is, is that his concussion symptoms were already getting better as when we started working with each other. And, well, with with the courage that he took in order to make the changes himself, well, the symptoms and the signs just started going away quite rapidly. So we started working in September. And by October, he was back at light practices with his soccer team, but no heading. By November the 2nd, he was able to begin the regular indoor soccer season right on time. So he never missed a beat. He continued to play in his pool league all winter. He skied all winter long in the Canadian Rockies. And he never missed a day of work. And I know that for a lot of people who are suffering from concussions or post-concussion syndrome, that is a remarkable story. But the thing is, is that he had made a promise to himself that he was going to get well, that he couldn't live like this, and he would not accept anything less. So he took the steps in order to make himself a stronger person. And that really is what Chinese medicine is all about. It helps a person to become stronger so that they can overcome the difficulties that created the problem in the first place. I love it. I, I, you gave him such great advice. I, I think that we all should take that into consideration because I think anything can be resolved in communication. 
And it oftentimes it's in our blind spot that there's a third option. So it's <laughs> fantastic to have a, an accountability holder. Um, just like it, when we go see a doctor, I really think that we should uh, bring a friend with us. Um, I've been going to a lot of the doctor's appointments. My friend is battling breast cancer and I go to her doctor's appointments, both her um, naturopathic appoint appointments and we've gone to oncologist and surgery appointments. And just having a second or third person um, in the room, uh, the doctor responds differently. The you can you can mm. take in more information. So it's like an accountability a partner, um, in a sense, an advocate. But yeah. when it comes to communicating with a supervisor, you know, a lot of times we resort back to that. You know, uh, being afraid. Like I don't I don't want to lose my job. I don't. You know, I'm not sure what's going to happen. What if I what do I say gets on my file? And uh, but exactly that asking for you know weekly what are the goals you have uh, for me what what measurable results do you want me to achieve in this job because that level of communication and accountability can relieve so much stress instead of sitting there worrying all week about am i doing this right asking for uh the the supervisor or the the boss to to lay out give me concrete goals that i can work towards i think i think that's fantastic um, was your son well, ever suicidal uh, during his concussion symptoms? No, I don't think he ever lost hope because that really is what happens with suicide victims. It's because they've totally lost hope. They're nothing, they haven't been able to uh, locate what it is that gives meaning to their lives. And the thing is, is that with the way I do things, it really is about... Um, learning uh, new life skills and practicing them because my son has told me about two separate occasions where he's had to go back and do the same thing and it just got easier and easier. <laughs> the, the first time was definitely really hard but the second and third time not not as difficult and so he knows he can deal with situations like this. So if someone is suffering from, let's say they, they were speaking to the listeners in the future, if they were to experience a concussion or, or their child experiences a concussion, what are the steps? What should, what should they do um, right when they know the concussions happened? Is there, and, and then leading up to, you know, getting ready to, to heal it, w w what should we do? Well, okay. The, the first thing that I want to make clear is that just because you have a blow to the head, it doesn't mean you're going to have a concussion. What we really need to look at, because it doesn't happen to everybody. I mean, you can get a concussion just, you know, just getting out of the car because you bumped the top of your head, you know, to the roof of the of the door of the car. Uh, you know, that's happened to me. N not because I've had not because I had a concussion, but because I, yeah, I really hurt my head when I was coming out of the car because I was in a hurry. And, uh, you know, so even the slightest thing can hurt somebody or you can even have concussion symptoms without actually ever having a blow to the head and nobody remembering how you did it. So the first thing is really to understand is, is to ask yourself, why has the brain if you do have a concussion, why has the brain become weakened? Okay, so that's the first question you've got to ask and it's always going to be mental emotional because I'll let you in on some Chinese uh, anatomy because the gallbladder meridian runs th through the side of the head around the ears, down the back of the neck, the shoulder and then along the side of the body uh, through the sciatic nerve and then along the side of the, the outside side of the leg to, um, to the little toe. So that's where the gallbladder meridian goes. So if Nolan had been weak in the legs or the knee, then it would have affected him there. The thing is about the gallbladder is that it governs decision making. So remember, in the story, I told you he could not decide. He was so stressed out. Do I stay? Do I go? Do I stay? Do I go? And then it, he was paralyzed because he didn't want either. Neither answer was what he wanted. 
So he was really stressed out by not being able to make a decision. And it was a good thing that he didn't make a rash decision because it probably would have only made things worse. <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that why does the brain become so weakened that we actually have the concussion? Okay, so once we have the concussion, we really have to take a deep dive into, well, what's upsetting us in our, life, in our lives right now? We have to face that issue because the true basis of Chinese medicine, because I won't call it traditional or classical, it's just medicine really, is, is mental emotional. And then you have the physical symptoms. The blow to the head was, I guess, pretty much like God saying, a knock on the head, hey, wake up, you got to do something about this. <laughs> and, and so he, it only made things worse until he realized that he couldn't do this on his own. So the first thing is to look for what are the things that are upsetting me and to admit to them that they are upsetting. And then once you are aware of that situation in your life and admitting to it, then you can do something about it because it's all about being proactive. I helped my son identify the one huge issue in his life that was extremely upsetting to him and then helped him to solve that problem in a positive, constructive way. And that's the other thing that is very important, solving the problem in a positive, constructive way. We cannot embark on some negativity, on some destructive behavior, which is only going to make things worse for us, not for the other person <laughs> or the other situation, because it always comes back on us. And so, so that's the first step. The second step, the third step really is about then looking at all the things that you have achieved over your life, even though it's a short one, and you will find that you are indeed strong enough to get over this obstacle just like you did all the other things. So... It's all mentally emotional. No drugs, no supplements, not even acupuncture. You know, I mean, I used acupuncture in order to strengthen my son's resolve, to, to strengthen his uh, decision making, to give him courage. So in that case, you see, his eyes were affected because... Interestingly, uh, the liver governs the eyes in Chinese medicine, and the liver and the gallbladder are actually interrelated and have are and are in one system together. So the liver gives courage, and also governs the eyes. And of course, he went blind, right? And so once you have that courage, you can make the right decision. And when you have made the right decision, how do you know if you've made the right decision? You're happy. You're relieved. When you haven't made the right decision, you won't feel good. Mm -hmm. I love that. Every naturopath I have ever interviewed has said that we, we want to listen for the symptoms the body's telling us, um, whether it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, just listen. If you can listen to the whispers and catch it and become aware of it, then you can, you know, change your course in life, change your habits, uh, diet, uh, spiritual practices, whatever you need to, to shift. But you want to catch those whispers before it becomes the you know, the, the two, two by four hitting you over the head. <laughs> yeah. Like in my son's case, it's true. It's very, very painful to go through that. But you know, on the other hand, uh, like I said, if it, if it wasn't his head, it could have been his knees. It could have been his ankle. It could have been his, his hip. It could have been sciatic nerve, right? I mean, a lot of people have sciatica, What's going on in their lives? <laughs> mm -hmm. What are they having difficulty in making decisions about? What are they? But the thing is, it's always about um, whenever we have a physical issue, 
Uh, whenever we have a mental emotional issue that gets worse, it's always about resisting change. Because these issues are always an opportunity to grow and get stronger and to get to know ourselves better. There, uh, that's that's how healing really begins. I mean, reading your bio and about the things that you struggled with, um, being told that you would never have a baby, and God bless you for not believing the diagnosis of an MD. I mean, that's what I want to tell your audience is ignore that that terrible diagnostic because in effect it really is just a mere description of what you already know <laughs> you know it doesn't help you in any way whereas in Chinese medicine we actually tell you why this is happening to you so it's not the what so it's not a blow to the head that's not why you have a concussion there are many more underlying issues that are not even that subtle you know <laughs> it's not even that subtle all we have to do is even look at someone, observe them, you know, are they, are they behaving the way they normally do? Because concussions are not invisible. Uh, I was interviewed by uh, another great podcaster several months ago, and she used to be a high school teacher. And she knew her students well enough that when they appeared at school, uh, dis disheveled, you know, glassy-eyed, you know, something totally out, out of normal for those kids. She knew that something had happened, and but for some reason, um, medical authorities aren't telling you these things. I, I would think a parent should know their kid really well to know that something is wrong. I would think that uh, a sports coach should know the kids on a team or the adults on a team, they should know these people well enough to know that something is wrong when they are behaving in a certain way or looking a certain way that isn't normal for them. So that's why I I'm say that diagnosing a concussion isn't hard at all. It's, it's, not, it's very simple to diagnose a concussion. But the treatment that's where we have to dig in and in conventional medicine there really is no treatment and what there is is kind of willy-nilly and wishy-washy when they tell you to um, stop everything go into a dark room um, don't touch the computer um, stay in a dark room for a few days if not up to a week and even their own research has revealed that telling people to do this is counterproductive that it actually pro that it could actually prolong the symptoms or make them worse and and also make people more susceptible to suicide mm -hmm. and and that's because when you're left to yourself and you have no guidance are you thinking the best <laughs> or are you thinking the worst so so this type of misinformation, I, I, you know, and I know it's not intentional, but they are definitely doing a heck of a lot more harm and, and at the same time not taking responsibility for it, for the advice that they give. And they, they keep saying, oh, well, we need more research. We have the research, people. <laughs> we don't need any more research. What we have to do now is focus on solutions. And I'm really into comprehensive solutions for people to get the expected results. I love it. And, you know, it's funny. Uh, we want lots of solutions from all these you know, research institutes, but, but they don't make money coming up with solutions. They make money researching. <laughs> 
Isn't that the truth? And and it's very ironic, isn't it? I mean, what 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 confounds me, what floors me every time is uh, is when they come out with a study that gives you a statistical analysis of who can who's more susceptible to get a concussion, who's more susceptible to uh, having more than one concussion, you know, you know, blah blah blah. Uh, I, I'd like to use some strong language here, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, it's it's so useless. It's useless research. We don't need that. We don't need it. What we need are concrete solutions for people to get the results that they want, and and that's what Chinese medicine in general is focused on. Um, in in for me, I am focused on the mental emotional because I know that's where it starts, that's where the trouble starts, and that's where it's going to end. And when somebody becomes that strong person again, I mean, they can conquer the world. I absolutely agree with you. I mean, there's so many other doctors that um, I've read their books that they've, they, 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 share very similar um, experiences, but never from the traditional uh, Chinese uh, medicine standpoint. Dr. Hammer created meta medicine. Um, he's a German uh, research doctor who lost his son to cancer and he decided oh, yes. to, um, to look into what's going yeah. on in the brain. And yeah, uh, yeah he did these brain scans um, and worked with over 30,000 people. And what he figured out was that um, there was a, a, a mental emotional a root cause of every illness not only yes. cancer but every illness and if you came to him and you said i have acne he would uh -huh. say to you <laughs> uh you're having a boundaries issue in your life and this is you know you need to do this and he was not a um, touchy-feely kind of guy he would take women who had breast cancer for example because breast cancer he discovered was a, a conflict with depending on whether it was a left or right breast and whether they were left or right handed whether it would be a conflict with um an older male figure like a father yeah, or yeah. or a husband or, or brother but like a close male figure he would take them out of their life yeah. remove them from their family from those people and they would heal much faster um mm -hmm. than than if they were to stay in the situation now, of course that doesn't solve their long-term problems they need to resolve them but uh but this is he he saw through like I said, over 30,000 uh, case studies, he saw that there's a direct correlation, a root cause between the mental emotional conflict yep. and the disease. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's not enough of them considering that as a possibility because that really is the number one thing. And I, I guess with regards to breast cancer, um, I had heard quite a while ago that when women are removing their breasts, it is about becoming more male and relinquishing the femininity, the female part of themselves, which is pretty sad. And uh, do you mean like removing them uh, to, to to prevent physically, preventively, like uh, Angelina Jolie decided mm. to remove her breasts preventively? No, no. Well, that's another story entirely. But when when women have breast cancer and they have to be removed, it really comes down to them denying their their femaleness and becoming more male. That's what it comes down to. So that's a mental emotional thing because being a female has been extremely painful. Do you oh, do you mean that that they they have to deal with that conflict like they're they to nurture their femininity or, or bring out their femininity yeah be themselves you know because uh that doctor is right you know it, it is about having trouble with the male counterparts in their lives because they've been dominated but i've also had clients where i've had to teach them to to assert themselves and to stand up for themselves because there's a bunch of other uh, symptoms for women, not just breast cancer. Again, you know, it depends on where they're weak in their body. Mm -hmm. So for a lot of women, they have uh, urinary infections. Well, um, since that's at the bottom of the body, um, it's affected by fear. 
okay? And uh, not having a lot of confidence uh, because one of my clients, she, a woman in her early 40s, beautiful, and uh, very talented, very smart, but she was al- almost um, incontinent. And uh, and going on the verge of being uh, fecal incontinent, and she had to. She planned all her trips around where the nearest washroom was. Oh she couldn't. Gosh. She could not stay in a meeting for the entire time because she had to rush to a washroom. She couldn't drive for very long because she needed a washroom. <laughs> and you know, like life was so difficult. And then you know. When we worked together and understanding that she felt so pushed around by everybody in her family, her in-laws, sisters, you know, this sort of thing. So teaching her to, to assert herself, teaching her that, um, I mean, for her to see for herself that she was worth it, that she was this talented person who deserved to be listened to, who deserved to, you know, to be respected. Um, the stronger she got mentally, emotionally, uh, um, and, and then the, symptom, the physical symptoms started to disappear. And then all of a sudden, you know, because she went to her urologist and he said, well, you, the only alternative you have is to wear a catheter for the rest of your life or to have a urinary bladder uh, what was it that uh, transplant mm. and like weird <laughs> and then so she asked him so how do I prevent this do I really have to go through something like this and of course he couldn't answer so so by the time I was done with her she was able to drive for hours and hours without having to stop she could get through a meeting you know, a couple of hours without having to stop, interrupt a meeting and go out. She, you know, we looked at everything, diet. We looked at, you know, but the thing was, was to strengthen the resolve in her that she deserved. I love, I love that story. Do you have, do you have any more uh, stories of um, like a common uh, issue, common physical ailment that's actually, that's related to, or the root cause is an emotional one and, and how you help someone resolve it? Oh, geez. How many? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, what would be common? Knee injury? Uh, yeah. How about arthritis or knee pain? That's something that's quite common. Oh, yeah. Arthritis. Yeah, I had a very young woman uh, come to me. She had really severe arthritis in her hands, in her fingers. And there were days, I mean, she was a young mother. So um, it was, it would really be very tough if she couldn't use her hands. And um, because they were a very active family and they did things all the time. So in the summertime, you know, they, she always looked forward to the camping season. So she'd always be getting that all prepared, um, the trailer camper all prepared and everything, every weekend. And of course, it would also mean, you know, moving things in, taking things out, washing things up. And so she would be the one making the preparations because she's wife of, uh, of an executive. So... Um, but the hands, they were in so much pain. And with her, interestingly enough, it was an issue with the men in her family, and especially her father. She had a twin brother, which wasn't too bad, but she did have older, an older brother. Can't re- I think she was the only girl in the family. And her father's attitude towards her was extremely negative. And almost stereotypical. And uh, he just ripped her apart as much as he could when she was growing up. And, you know, she always had these stomach problems and digestive problems. You see, by the time I saw her, she was on a subsistence diet. And she was taking all these supplements and vitamins, which she didn't want to take for the rest of her life. But she wasn't eating a whole lot, and yet she was planning on going to this trip to Mount Kilimanjaro um, a few months later. 
And so she came to me because from the testimonials of people um, that she saw uh, stuck up on my on my clinic window at the time, she could see that there was something different about me. And so she walked in um, and we talked for a little bit and then uh, she decided to come work with me. And, and yeah, you know, we, we worked on her self-esteem. We worked on strategies about dealing with her father and her mother <laughs> and her brothers. And, you know, she had already gone on a path where she was already sticking up for herself, but she needed a bit more. So she needed more oomph. She needed to feel that she was right for the way she felt and that she had the right to express an opinion and she had a right to lead her life the way she wanted to and it, and it was a very good life you know like how could anybody judge right but some people in her family were so had to teach her a lot of things like that and also about talking to her body and saying to, and saying to her joints that I need you I need, I need you because of this. I need you because of the things that I need to do, and the, this is what I need to do. And so it was that communication between herself and her body and and herself and her family and how she dealt with the issues and all that. And finally, forgiving herself because often we blame ourselves, right? And since this sort of thing started happening when she was just a little girl, you know, she had a lot of baggage. So it was really important that she forgive herself as often during the day as possible. <laughs> as soon as she felt guilty about anything, get rid of it because guilt is a pretty useless emotion. All it's gonna do is just keep you sick. And so in the end, um, I got her on her blood type O diet, and she was able to eat everything on that diet again. In fact, when she told me uh, one time that she was at a restaurant and she said, oh, my God, I have so many choices now. What am I going to do? <laughs> and, it was, it, and it was nice. And it was nice to have all those choices again. So she went from starving and trying to keep up with her training to go up that mountain <laughs> to being fully strong physically and mentally again and, and, and being able to have choices again. So being able to digest properly, being able to enjoy eating again, being able, which really equates to being able to enjoy life again and no more pain in her wrists and her and her fingers and she was strong enough to go about her life in the way that she wanted to so Amazing. it was great I, now I, I know you can't hear me nodding but i've been like nodding my <laughs> head yes the entire time <laughs> I awesome. love it. Oh, you're such an amazing doctor because I feel like you'd be like so like you are really an advocate for them. You, you're really like an accountability yeah. partner. You're almost like the best friend everyone needs. You know, I really want to be because I've said um, your goals are my goals. I want what you want. And that's where we start. That's fantastic. Um, I am. Um, one of the things I did in my past is uh, I was a coach. Um neuro-linguistic programming and and one of the women I worked with this was like 10 years ago one of the women I worked with had chronic back pain and she was on three major pain medications yeah and uh, in an eight-hour breakthrough session with her we got to the root cause which was she was holding on to massive guilt from um mm -hmm. she was a um, Roman Catholic and yeah. and she had an abortion and didn't tell anyone uh and she uh, said d right before the procedure she said to the mm. doctor she said I don't want any pain meds because I, I, I need to pay for this in pain oh no and she buried mm. that memory and when we got to that point I had wow. said to her um I nearly fell off my chair I said did yeah you, did you just hear yourself she goes oh oh no I, I I paid I paid for it I didn't I you know I I had the it was a painful um abortion yeah. because I didn't take my meds I'm like 
Mm-hmm. But and but you're still <laughs> suffering. You're still you're still giving yourself pain. And she went from a ten out of ten back pain to completely being gone once we resolved the guilt. And yeah, she had, was holding on to all this guilt, and she completely buried it and forgot for years and years and years. But she kept feeling guilty in her life, and every time she felt guilty, her pain would spike. But she was. Yeah. Um, unaware it was out of, out of her awareness she needed someone to hold a mirror up and help her see that what was going on but after that she she actually was able to throw out her medications yeah <laughs> great and- well it's interesting because the kidney system in chinese medicine it governs that part of the body the lower back and the reproduction system so and it is affected by guilt and fear and shame mm. so yeah i mean wow that was a major breakthrough and thank God she met you. <laughs> yeah, I, it was. I felt this. I felt. I felt so honored to have been in, in that experience as well because it really solidified my belief that the mind-body connection we, is a hundred percent real. That we have to absolutely do what you you are preaching. We have to listen to what's going on to try to bring out you know what we've put in our blind spots um so it sounds like you have these questions that you help jog people to become conscious of what's going on in their blind spots now i know you've written three books tell us about your books is this something that we can buy to um help us uh get to this point where we can start to heal these emotional mental parts of ourselves so that we can either heal physical ailments or maybe prevent them Oh yeah, definitely. Each one of my books, I mean, they they're I have three books that are about concussions, knockout concussions, heal your concussion, uh, 21 days to brain health and my best seller which is heal your concussion um, how to quickly and effectively get back in the game uh, is my latest one. I mean, um, they all talk about they all I, I describe a bit of Chinese medical anatomy in there and describe how each system is affected by which emotions and what happens when they are affected, but not just the negative part, but what happens when you adopt the positive emotions that are there that we all have control over because we really do have control over our emotional state it's whether we choose to to be in control and on the other hand also to become aware finally of what we are doing to ourselves because that's the thing that modern psychology you know the the research just like it is for uh, neuroplasticity and neuroscience the research is there However, they're not using it. They're not applying it. They don't know how to apply the information that they've got. So they're great at accumulating the knowledge, but when it comes to actually using it and applying it to help people get better, that's a totally different story. (laughs) Well, I love that what you're doing, you're you're definitely taking in all the... um learnings from the different uh, research that you see but you you're you're using what what's been working for thousands i mean chinese medicine has been around for over 5000 years has it not yeah yeah and i've said that if it was full of quackery as some people insist then why is it that it's still alive and thriving today you right. know if if it wasn't meant to be living it's it's still a live living medicine which continues to evolve and grow so there are people like myself who have discovered new things and are using the old modalities and bringing them into the 21st century and and I'm really excited at at the prospects and at the potential because we're still helping people that's the thing it's still working <laughs> I love it now you'd mentioned that you had uh, your patient go on the O blood type diet which Dr. Diadamo was actually my naturopath yeah. when I was 6 years old <gasps> really so, yep and so we I went from being sick all the time. He got us on the O blood type diet, which is very paleo. Yeah. And yep. so we removed all dairy and back, you know, being in the eighties, early eighties, having to go dairy free, <laughs> there was yeah. like no options like soy, soy milk. But of course it was before GMO. So it was okay. But, um, dairy free, you know, wheat free, um, and, and then not mixing, like don't eat when you eat fruit, don't mix it with anything else. Uh, which is interesting if you look at, um, the Judaism 
and yeah. their diet recommendations like don't mix uh dairy with anything and if mm -hmm. you look at those recommendations it's really yeah. neat to see that now in science that kind of that comes over and there's now an understanding as to why you don't you don't do food combining so is the oh is the um eat right for your blood type diet one of your favorite diets to recommend for health and healing or do you go case by case it's definitely one of my very favorites. I mean, I started using that when I was a layman. So 1994, I think, was when it came out. And it was actually a fellow engineer, engineering friend of mine who told me about it because she was actually a blood type O vegan. Oh, my gosh. Exactly. <laughs> so she was, she was white as a sheet, skinny as a rake, and everybody thought she was healthy. But she didn't agree with that. <laughs> so she stopped being a vegan when she found out about the blood type diet. And she was uh, reintroducing herself to, um, to animal products. So she was starting out with fish first and then eventually, you know, leading up to beef. But, uh, you know, she could still run like the wind, which uh, because blood type O's are great at this sort of thing, right? Um, and... Uh, and I was having problems with my joints at the time and wondering what the heck is going on. And so she told me about the book. I was fascinated, so I picked it up right away and read the entire book and realized, oh, my God, I have the answer. I have my – because my husband's a blood type O, my youngest son is a blood type O, my oldest is an A, just like me. And I realized that I was serving a blood type O diet based on my own – on my husband's preferences <laughs> because we instinctively know what we like, right? Right. Not, not always, but – Pretty often, and so I realized it was attack all that all this you know tomatoes and stuff they were attacking my joints and mm -hmm. oh my god, so it was really good that um, and of course with the blood type diet there are differences between Caucasians, uh, blacks and Orientals, and so we could adjust these things uh, f and fine tune it. And so I use that if my clients, if my students know what their blood type is. And then I use that in conjunction with uh, Chinese dietary therapy as well. Oh, now tell us a little bit about that. I've never heard about the dietary therapy um, in respect to, to Chinese medicine. Well, um, modern medicine, they or diet, uh, dietitians, uh, nutritionists, they focus on the nutrients. But there's a lot more to food than just the nutrients. The Chinese actually look at food in the way a food, a particular food, will affect your body. So there are some innate qualities in foods. Uh, for instance, um, they may not be thermally cold, but some foods are are going to cool down your body too much if you eat too much of it. Other foods are going to be warming uh, and so they might make your body hot. To, um, so you can either become cold or, or too hot pathologically. So let's say because, okay, um, a lot of people are into raw foods. Bad idea. Ah. <laughs> Okay, so the thing is, is that for one thing, cellulose in the cell walls of plants are very hard to break down in the human digestive system. So you're not going to benefit from getting all the nutrients out of those cells. Right. They say that people with irritable bowel syndrome or people with digestive problems or inflammation shouldn't eat raw vegetables. They should eat really well-cooked vegetables, uh, for example, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is that most vegetables, well, all vegetables actually have a cooling effect on the body, which will also affect the digestive system. Because we kind of look at the, in Chinese medicine, we look at the digestive system as being uh, our oven. So it should be hot, you know, it should be warmed up. But if we're continuously eating a lot of raw foods, then we're cooling 
down our digestive system and so we lose our digestive power after a certain amount of time. The thing is, is that a person, if I diagnose them to have a lot of heat in their body, then yeah, you know, increasing the amount of raw vegetables is good for them until they don't need it anymore. When they are feeling, because a really hot person, and I know you've probably met some, you know, they're red in the face. Uh, they can go out in Canadian winter without a coat. I know no, a few. Yes, I do. <laughs> right. So that's actually abnormal. <laughs> so there's a lot of heat in their bodies. So I've treated people, um, whether they've had, um, uh, what is it, um, night sweats, you know, hot flashes, and this happens in men and women, not just menopausal women, and even that's a myth, you know. <laughs> Menopause has nothing to do with hot flashes and, um, and night sweats, you know. <laughs> really? Really, yes. It's not a given. So, so you know, with guys, uh, usually it's people with very hot tempers that have very hot bodies. And so... When you teach these people to calm down, when you treat them to calm them down, to take control of that very strong emotion, then their body also starts cooling off naturally. Plus, you know, the fact that I give them the Chinese dietary theory plus their blood type diet if they happen to know their blood type. And sometimes I have to, you know, help them more with a Chinese herbal formula which will cool them down and also help them uh, psychologically as well with the anger issues. So, you know, there's lots that we can do to help them. Now, for someone who's um, got night, fl uh, night, night sweats and, and hot flashes, you know, then, you know, we got to look at the hot things that they like to eat because certainly wine and alcoholic drinks are hot by nature. Uh, if they smoke, smoking tobacco is very hot by nature. <laughs> you know, so we, we look at things like that, you know, for example, and someone who's very cold, well, then we, again, look at their diet. If they're eating a lot of raw, raw salads, a lot of raw vegetables, and we cut them out for the time being until they regain balance. And then they have to eat everything cooked, everything hot, or, or warm or room temperature until they start warming up naturally. You know, so, so that's why it's, it's, Chinese medicine is very intuitive that way. And and it only and it's and it kind of comes down to common sense, but only if you really know that foods have that kind of effect on you. And so we have all these tools that are just so natural and and common sense at the same time. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now for uh, people who are just going through about their day to day life, and maybe they're shoveling snow, and all of a sudden they throw out their back, or maybe they just wake up and they feel like they throw out their neck. You know, oh, yeah, I've got my neck all of a sudden is very, very stiff and it's painful, or their back or something, and they don't, there wasn't any major injury. Um, so, like, that's it's very common to kind of just have that, you know, those aches and pains, and that, like, I have a friend who. Uh, right now is actually icing his back uh, and he, he can hardly walk and he thinks he re-injured his back because uh, he, mm -hmm. he's been having a few he, he lifted something too heavy uh, mm -hmm. in those in those circumstances um, what's what's what do you recommend for them what, what's going on because you know and I know that every listener who's listening is gonna at some point in their future have that wake up and go oh my my neck hurts, my back hurts, Some, you know, something's going to happen. What do you recommend we do? Well, um, be really honest with yourself, uh, starting there, and realize that you just had a traumatic experience with something that you didn't like. Um, you know, like um, a few weeks ago, I was having a sore back, and uh, and a week, a few weeks before that, it was a sore neck, and and I realized that with the sore neck, it was because well, I'm being narrow-minded, can't bend, 
can't nod. So, so that is telling you that you disagree with someone's point of view or you disagree with uh, a change that you perceive to be something that you want to avoid, but in reality, you can't. You have to go with it. With the back pain, it was because I was worried about something. Yeah, that's what it was. I was worried about something. And let's say it's about money. That's that's usually what happens to people. People worry about money. And, uh, and it was probably because I was thinking that I couldn't afford something. Or, or I was trying to – or I was thinking – um, how do I afford it? You know, something like that. And all of a sudden I've got this back pain. There's, there's always a reason behind it. We just have to actually admit it, that something is bothering us. Mm-hmm. And when I got to the point of, okay, I have this back pain, um, or I had this neck pain, and then I did something constructive and positive about it. I mean, something about my behavior that needed to change, okay? And so instead of looking on the black side of light of life, I started looking at the bright side of life and decided, okay, I'm worried because uh, that this might happen. So, so why am I focused on that? Why aren't I focused on the things that I really want, which is the opposite of that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I started to do that. And I observed how long it took for me to recover within days. Mm-hmm. Within days. I love it. <laughs> I love it. And uh, doctor, have you read the book Healing Back Pain by Dr. John E. Sarno? No, I haven't. Oh, it's a, it's a good one. It's, a, it's sort of a classic in, in, my, in my mind. Um, I, I try to, I'm trying to get him on the show, but his um, publicist yeah. says he's retired. He's, oh. he's like something in his like late 80s, or early 90s. But um, he noticed that people who came in for back surgeries weren't, they, their chronic pain wasn't going away. They'd come in, they would, you know, yeah. um, cut out the, the mm-hmm. disc that was bulging. They'd put a big rod in the back and then they'd, and then they'd you know, call up the person a year later later to see how they were doing and uh, they were still having their chronic back pain so all these surgeries weren't working no um and he was like well we've he started exploring well what's going on if all these certain surgeries were completely useless and we're harming the person further because we're cutting out discs and yeah shoving rods up their back what's what's going fusing we're fusing their vertebrae because yeah. apparently that would help, and it 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 didn't it didn't help at all. It, it caused you know worse problems for many many of the surgeries, and he looked at a, a large uh, database of surgeries, and so he went on uh, the hunt for what was actually causing the back pain, and he came to the same conclusion that you are teaching which is that it was it's an emotional mental thing that we're uh, it's in our unconscious or in our blind spot and uh, and you're doing you're doing exactly what he talks about doing which is to get to that to ask yourself the questions to start looking at and focusing on what you want instead of focusing on what you don't want but it's absolutely amazing how um, we can sit we can close our eyes and sit and we could raise our heart rate we could mm-hmm. just by what we focus on we could close our eyes and we could think of the worst things that could possibly happen to us and our and our body would pump out adrenaline and, yep. uh, and our our digestive digestive system would completely shift uh shunting blood away to, to from our digestion towards the extremities we would go into complete fight or flight mode just by sitting yeah. and imagining the worst case scenario yeah but yeah. what i'm i'm frustrated is that what's not taught in the school system, what's not taught is is life skills like how to be in control of our own emotions, how to be in control of our own thoughts and, and, and how to how to create uh, that that um, awareness. None of this is taught. And so we're all bumping around in life, acting like victims of life until we finally come across someone like you or some literature. We go seeking this information on I'm 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 really I urge uh, listeners to teach others this this info, because if we can all take responsibility for our um, 
thoughts that we can learn how to, then we can heal on so many levels. So I'm so excited what you're doing out there in the world. Now you've got a great website with some fantastic information, all the links to everything um, that Dr. Joni does is going to be uh, in the show notes of today's podcast, but it's your website is drjoanny.com. And you have an email list where you send people the five things that you should never do when you have an injury, which as a, a young mother, I'm, I'm like, my kid is, you know, almost 17 months old. And, yeah. I, and I'm like, I know the injuries are on the way, right? <laughs> so I want to make sure I'm doing the right thing. So definitely signing up for your email list. Uh, so absolutely, we want that. Um, now, how can people work with you uh, if they're not in Calgary, Alberta, Canada? Can they can they Skype with you? How, how can people work with you? Oh, definitely. They can Skype with me. We can be on the phone. Um, certainly um, through the initial diagnostic period, which is two to three hours, I would definitely need to have a visual of you. You know, so doing uh, video Skype would be fantastic. Excellent. So they just, do they email you or is there... Um... Okay, well, yeah, you've got to... Um, go to a link which is for an initial uh, consultation you'll see in my main navigation uh, system work work together yep i see that on your website right there under a picture of you yeah um it says yeah. work together okay fantastic yeah so we're going to definitely have a link to your to your website in the show notes um that's great so you you can work with people all around the world how how many lives do you think you've impacted through everything that you've been doing um as a doctor God, I don't know. I've never been asked that question before, but I sure hope it's thousands. I sure hope, you know, it's people that uh, I haven't met. I hope they've benefited from what I've been able to teach so far. Um, I'm, I just want people to be as, as successful and as happy as possible because we all deserve it. Yes. Now you've been on um, so many different news uh, channels. It's actually really exciting. You've been on Fox. Um, you've been on NBC. You've been on in Canada, CTV, and Global. Uh, and you, your book is a number one international best bestseller. So that's that, that's really exciting. It is. It is. It's been an amazing year. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'd love for you to challenge our listeners, something that they could do now and for the next seven days. Um, what kind of challenge can you give us uh, to improve our health in our life? Well, the first thing is to pay attention to what you're thinking about. If you start feeling upset over something, then you know that it's something that you don't like, and that's okay. You know, I don't want anybody to think that Feeling negatively about anything is the wrong thing to do, but I do want you to feel that you have control over it because it's, you know, instantaneous feeling negative about something, about a situation in your life isn't bad for you, but harboring it is. Don't let it grow. So as soon as you're aware of how you feel, I want you all to calm down, quiet your mind, and ask for help, and God will send it to you. I love it. Are there any questions that we could ask ourselves to help us to, to find clarity? Why am I upset over this? Do I have control over the situation? Do I have control over this person? Am I responsible for this person? Am I responsible for the situation? And if you can honestly say no <laughs> to all of these things, to the, to the last four things anyways, then let it go because it's none of your business. <laughs> You know, a few years ago, my husband and I heard um, a really interesting podcast where a man giving advice said, it's none of your business what other people think of you. Mm -hmm. And it hit us like a ton of bricks because, <laughs> you know, we're all caught up in in uh, worrying about what other people think. But really, it's it just like it's none of none of someone else's business what you're thinking. Yeah. It's none of your business what other people think of you. So stop worrying about it. 
Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, if people, if people are worried about what other people are thinking or, or doing, then you have way too much time in your hands. <laughs> you got to find some purpose and a definite goal. <laughs> mm, I love that. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate everything you're doing. I know you're making such a positive impact in the world. I'd love to have you on the show again. The next time you uh, launch a book, definitely come back on the show and share with us um, about everything that you are doing in the future. Oh, great, because I will be launching a, a relatively inexpensive program in the next few months. So I'd be... Oh. Well, well, tell tell us about this program. What's a, what's do you have a name for it now? Uh, not quite. Uh, not quite yet. It's in it's in the works. Yeah. So <laughs> fantastic. Well, can you tell us a bit about it, or is it um, is it still a secret? It's still yeah. It's still in the se- It's still a secret. It's still in the works. So <laughs> well, I, I actually I know how much time and energy and thought goes into coming out with an online program I've, I've released some in the past and so uh. um, absolutely I, I'm a big cheerleader of what you're doing and I look forward to hearing all about your wonderful online program that you're going to be launching um, definitely come back on the show when it's when it's available so you can share uh, more I will. about it with us oh absolutely I'd love to Ashley love to Terrific. <laughs> are you looking to optimize your health Are you looking to get the best supplements at the lowest price for high quality supplements and to talk to someone about what supplements are best for you, go to takeyoursupplements.com and one of our fantastic true health coaches will help you pick out the right supplements for you that are the highest quality and the best price. That's takeyoursupplements.com. TakeYourSupplements.com. That's TakeYourSupplements.com. Be sure to ask about free shipping and our awesome referral program.